everyone, and thanks for joining me for this presentation as part of Alumni and Family Weekend. My name is Nancy Greco, and I'm the College Archivist. My role here at Fisher is to preserve the history of St. John Fisher College by holding dear the artifacts that have been left behind and that can tell the story of this institution. In addition, I'm an educator and help students learn about archival and primary source research. I do a lesson with all incoming first year students in which they study Fisher artifacts from 1968. Were any of you here in 1968? I teach students to use the evidence that can be found in the archive alongside the context of the time to try to piece together a story. They use newspaper articles, meeting minutes and correspondence, all of which can be found in the college archive. What they discover is that drawing conclusions in this way is very difficult. We bring our own biases and our experiences to the table and we really have no idea what's missing. An archive will only hold those things that have been collected by the archivist and donated by the institution's people. In many ways, the archivist is the gatekeeper, deciding what's important to keep and what to discard. I take this part of my job really seriously. At times, my conclusions have proven to be incorrect. So if you believe you have something to add, or perhaps you feel that some part of my interpretation of the artifacts is inaccurate, please let me know. I really like to learn more. Here's a photograph that I use with my students because it tells us a lot about the school in its early days. I asked students to interpret this photograph. You can see that in the early days of Fisher, in fact, all the way through the 1960s, St. John Fisher College was an all men's school. The students had a dress code and it was a Christian school as evidenced by the cross on the wall. The college was run by the congregation of St. Basil, an order of Catholic priests. You can see Father Leonard Rush teaching in this photograph. We owe a great deal to Father Hugh Haffey who masterminded the plan to fund the college. Father Haffey was born in Wheeland, Ontario, Canada in 1905 and attended St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto, the headquarters, if you will, of the Bazillion Order. He was ordained in the Congregation of St. Basil in 1931. At Aquinas Institute, a Rochester area high school, he taught chemistry and public speaking and served as vice principal for 10 years. Father Haffey led the campaign and fund drive to build Aquinas Stadium. He began a Christian culture lecture series that brought many notable writers, educators, scientists, and statesmen to the school to speak. Here he is at the dedication of the stadium. He must have done a really good job because his next assignment was to be the executive director to establish St. John Fisher College, a new Catholic college for men. Father Happy's first order of business was to purchase land on which to build the college. In an article in the Times Union, Father Happy recalls the rainy day in August of 1947, when he inspected the 72 acres of farmland which were to become St. John Fisher College. Here's a quote from him in the, in the paper. A brother priest from Aquinas Institute and I tramped every foot of that land. I just wanted to make sure it was the right spot. I stood at the corner of East Avenue and Fairport Road, looked back on, at the hill and said, when God made that hill, he made it for St. John Fisher College. I wanted the top of this hill and had in mind a passage from our Lord from St. Matthew, a city built upon a hill cannot be hid. And so the fundraising began with a meeting arranged by Bishop Carney as a kickoff to a diocesan-wide fund drive. Here's a view of the capacity audience at the Eastman Theater on January 27, 1948. Cardinal Spellman kicked off the campaign with a $25,000 gift 
Although in the marginalia of Father Haffey's manuscript illustrating the beginnings of the college, he seemed to indicate that he was none too fond of the Cardinal, who tended to treat him as an errand boy during his time here in Rochester. Father Haffey implemented precision and a competitive spirit in conducting the campaign with chairs and parishes across the diocese competing for pledges. The campaign was a well-oiled machine in Father Haffey's capable hands. By February 23rd, the campaign goal was exceeded with a final tally for the project reaching over $1,200,000. Groundbreaking ceremonies were held on Sunday, June 19, 1949. Bishop Carney presided with assistance from Father Haffey. Not long after the groundbreaking though, Father Haffey was moved to Catholic Central High School in Detroit and later to Houston, Texas, where he chaired the education department at the University of St. Thomas. Before leaving, Father Haffey designed the college seal that we continue to use today. It combines the element, elements from St. John Fisher's coat of arms, Brazilian symbols, and elements from Bishop Carney's coat of arms. Surrounding the shield is the name of the college in Latin. The top center shield is a chalice, Brazilian symbol for the priesthood. On either side are the initials M and R for Maria Regina, Mary, Queen of Heaven, these came from Bishop Carney's coat of arms. And on the lower left is the cross of St. James, surmounted by the shell, which is his traditional attribute. To the right is a combined image of a fish and ears of corn. Fish, ear, fisher. This comes from St. John Fisher's coat of arms. Beneath the scroll is the motto of the Basilians in Latin. Teach me goodness, discipline, and knowledge. After leaving in October of 1949, Father Haffey did not return to Fisher until the dedication of Haffey Hall in 1966. Here he is with his two nephews at the dedication. Here's an image of Haffey Hall, which stood alone before the campus center and other buildings began to surround it. Father John Francis Murphy is then assigned to become president of the college. It is Father Murphy who oversees the construction of Kearney Hall, which is for many years, the only building on campus. I have to admit that the artifacts that he left behind gave me the wrong impression about his personality. It was in a presentation such as this that an alum set me straight. This picture is the only one I could find where he is even somewhat smiling. This, his picture made him out to be rather austere. He seems to be, to me, very unassuming. He seemed unimpressed with his appointment as president of the college, given the scribbles on the back of the assigned assignment letter. His writings and speeches are serious and eloquent and somewhat flowery in language. I'll give you a moment to read that. The topics he spoke about revolved around morality and communism. I found nothing at all lighthearted in nature among his writings or his letters. Nonetheless, I've been told by some alum that he had a marvelous sense of humor and was always seen as a smiling figure. Go figure. None of the artifacts in the archive disclosed his true temperament and demeanor. I'm so glad that I had an opportunity to speak with some alum who knew him well. The construction of the Kearney building began at once. The Bazilians were determined to start classes in the fall of 1951. Well, more or less. Here's a picture from the Times Union on September 1951. 
and some quotes from that article. Classes started with scaffolding still in place. We're past the cru crucial stage. At least we don't get wet when it rains, proclaims Father O'Meara, the Dean of Students, as he reports from his sparsely finished office. I guess we're going to be in the part with the windows, says 18-year-old Ted Case, remarking as he looks at the, the almost ready South Wing. Here's an ad for the college. Remember that all the courses would be taught by priests from the congregation of St. Basil. Father Murphy was president and oversaw a series of very important firsts. That very first class of men was 120. There were only 10 faculty members on campus and tuition was $480. The first scholarship was given and the very first Pioneer College newspaper issue came out. And the, ver the first advisory board of regents was consisted of all bazillion fathers and the very first yearbook come out, came out as well. The official dedication, however, didn't happen until 1952. Here's a photo of uh, Joseph Myler speaking at the dedication. He was one of the very first trustees. It was a beautiful day for the outdoor dedication with over 5,000 people turning up for the event. The cornerstone was placed that day, came from St. Andrew's Cathedral in Rochester, England, which was once the cathedral of St. John Fisher, the martyr. Here you can see Bishop Kearney setting the cornerstone. The Glee Club was very popular and Fisher's Choir won several awards. The first Glee Club director was Frank Pilecki, one of the students. This photo is from a 1954 Christmas performance. You can see Father Munelli here. He headed the golf team, which was our very first intercollegiate sport. And this is the de dedication of the chapel, which was in the Kearney building, the only building on campus. Here you can see our white, white orchid ball from 1954. Oftentimes, during social events, the women from Nazareth would join our Fisher men. And of course, the very first commencement in 1955. Here you can see Father Murphy, Bishop Carney, and Father O'Meara, the Dean of Students. And here are a few other photographs from that very first commencement. Father Murphy also oversaw the construction of the very next building, the chemistry building, which we know as Piaq Hall today. It was completed in 1958, just before Father Murphy was called to serve as president of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. Father Charles Lavery becomes the second president of St. John Fisher College. He too comes to us from St. Michael's University in Toronto. He served as at Fisher from 1958 until he passed away at the age of 70 in, on December 3rd, 1985 from complications from pneumonia. In 1965, Father Lavery becomes a U.S. citizen, a much celebrated event. The Lavery years were ones of tremendous growth. He was a great champion for the college out in the community. He knew all the right people and knew how to get things done. You can see by some of these statistics, the improvements that happened over his tenure here. He served on numerous statewide committees, including Governor Kerry's Task Force for Higher Education, the Advisory Board for New York State Financial Aid Study, Rochester Area College Consortium, 
commission and the commission on independent colleges among others and he won innumerable awards from all of this service in the community he was also well liked by his students this is a photograph from 1978 here he's pictured when Fisher hosted a Frisbee competition, but golf was definitely his game. He had the golf course constructed across the road on Fisher property once he acquired the Druid Hills. He knew all the right people and used government connections to bring aid to the college. Here he is with Congressman Frank Horton and Nelson Rockefeller. He could often be found on local media and volunteered and supported public television and radio. You can see him here during the annual WXXI auction and fund drive, Rochester's local PBS station. Father Larry was also very active in Rochester interfaith initiatives. He frequently spoke at Jewish events and invited rabbis to speak at Fisher. Here he is with Daryl Friedman of the Jewish Federation. You can see Father Lavery in front of a tree on the top right hand side of this photograph. In June of 1971, President Richard Nixon attended a garden party at the home of Paul Miller, a member of Fisher's Board of Trustees. President Nixon and Father Lavery strike up a conversation around golf, of course. Later, Nixon sends Father Lavery a sleeve of official Nixon golf balls. In 1968, the college becomes independent from the Catholic diocese and women were first admitted in 1971. Both of these decisions were economic ones. In 1980, Father Braden took over as college president. By this time, Father Lavery had had some health issues and was more interested in working collaboratively with a group of Rochester area college administrators to advocate for more government funding and support. Now that the college had separated from the Catholic Diocese, Father Braden was the very first president of St. John Fisher College that had to interview for his position. All our other presidents had been appointed by St. Michael's and the Basilian Order. Father Braden also taught physics while acting as president. Father Braden was a very different type of of president, and it must have been really difficult for him to be in the shadow of Father Lavery, who is now given the title of Chancellor. Father Braden was more of a scholar than an administrator at heart. He taught classes even while serving as president. Father Braden faced many challenges, not the least of which was enrollment. At the time, New York State was forecasting a 30 to 40 percent drop in college enrollment over the next 10 to 15 years. Here, Father Braden is seen at the groundbreaking for a new dormitory or residence hall in today's parlance. Father Braden spent much of his time trying to raise funds and also appealing to a more international audience. This photograph, more than any other, speaks volumes about Father Braden's presidency. You can see both men with hands on the wheel. That must have been very difficult for him. Just to lighten the mood for a moment, I thought I'd share my favorite Fisher College prank. On February 21st, 1981, someone let loose 500 white mice on the third floor of Ward Hall. 
As much as they try to find the culprit, it still remains a mystery. No one knows who did it. Well, someone out there might, might know. They also don't know where the person managed to buy 500 white mice as they contacted every pet supplier in the area to find out who might have done it or where they might have come from. Father Braden, by 1985, decided that he would retire and the Board of Trustees signified the respect that they had for him. However, it was time for Father Braden to move on. The next president, William Pickett, was the very first non-Bazillion leader of the college. He was not well known for his ability to raise money and came to the presidency with a businessman's sensibilities. By this time, enrollment was down to 1,700 students. He served as chairman of the Commission on the Reorganization of Catholic Schools. As you can imagine, the commission's decision to close many of the diocese schools did not make him terribly popular in the community. Much of what's left of Dr. Pickett's tenure as president are many, many, many binders of reports around total quality management and the like. There are many images of Dr. Pickett interacting with students, but not many with him interacting with, out, with those outside of Fisher in the community or the state. By 1995, Pickett decides not to re-up his contract, giving Fisher a year's notice before leaving. Catherine Keough becomes Fisher's first woman president. Whenever she was interviewed, she would be asked about this, and her response was classic Catherine Keough. She would explain that, after the first week, you will hardly notice that I'm a woman. Dr. Keough managed to reverse a $1 million deficit at the college within two years. Dr. Keough won numerous awards, notably the Maury Silver Award and the Athena Woman of the Year Award. She and her husband joined the Foreign Service and spent 10 years in the Middle East prior to coming to Fisher. Her husband was one of the 51 hostages taken in Iran. She saw that her, her, her hardships were a blessing. Catherine can be credited for turning the college around. Her most well-known accomplishment was to bring the Buffalo Bills training camp to Fisher. She also acquired the Botsford property, which is the strip of land where the business school now sits. The college had tried to purchase it from Enid Botsford for many years, beginning with Father Lavery. Enid's husband finally sold it to Fisher after she passed away in the 1980s. Much like Father Lavery in his time, Catherine Keown knew all the right people and leveraged her relationship to benefit Fisher. Here, she's with Congresswoman Louise Slaughter and State Senator James Alessi. This photograph is from the, the groundbreaking of Founders Hall. Unfortunately, Catherine Keough passed away from bone cancer on September 25th, 2004. Dr. Donald Bain stepped into her shoes upon her passing. Dr. Bain had a long history with Fisher, starting as a professor of history. Dr. Bain completed many of the projects that Dr. Keough had hoped to see through, 
and many more through his own initiative. Dr. Bain retired in 2015 after having secured the largest gifts in Fisher's history. Our current and seventh president, Dr. Jerry Rooney, has been president only a few short years, but has been with Fisher for much longer, having served over 20 years and as Fisher's VP for Enrollment, Advancement, and Planning. What will his legacy be? Thank you so much for joining me today in reviewing Fisher's history. Please feel free to contact me at ngreco, N-G-R-E-C-O, at sjfc.edu. Have a wonderful day at Fisher.